This is ThinkTech Hawaii. Community matters here. One, huh, we're back, we're live, 10 o'clock on a given Wednesday. It's, it's uh, Wednesday, meaning energy day, right? Peter Rosek, Hawaiian Electric, is here. Hi, Peter. Good to see you, Always Jay. nice to see you. Thank Tony you. Gill. Tony from Gill Eva Lands, am I right? Yeah, this is an important project. And Nick uh, Hendrickson, who joins us uh, by phone. Uh, from where are you, Nick? I am in San Diego, California. Rainy San Diego, California, actually. Our hearts go out to you, Nick. <laughs> All right. <laughs> not, Thank not you. So I appreciate much. it. <laughs> not, not so We're here to talk about this uh, really interesting uh, project, um, which is uh, just coming together by an agreement um, with, um, of course, um, Tony, that's uh, Eva, Eva Land, Gil Eva Lands, uh, and a company called Eurus. Um, and Nick is the vice president of development at, at Eurus, and of course, Hawaiian Electric, Peter Rossick. So this is a very important project, um, and um, there's some heavy players involved in this for sure, and it has all the ring of something that changes the paradigm. Peter, present the project, okay? Well, I think really Nick should, but we worked with Eurus, and uh, we're, we're very excited to have uh, this project. It's uh, on the last viable, uh, developable wind uh, site on Oahu. Uh, Nick, why don't you lay out the technicalities? Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'll try to give a, a high-level overview of the project specifics, and, uh, and thank you for, for having me on, uh, albeit kind of remotely. Um, so this project is a wind project, like Peter referenced. It's going to be 13 turbines uh, located kind of above the, the Kahe power plant area and kind of back into the kind of the hills that kind of proceed back from that. Um, as far as total nameplate or capacity of generation, it's going to be about 47 megawatts. That will generate about 150 megawatt hours of electricity every year. So just for reference, that is equivalent to about you know 25, 27,000 you know average Oahu average Oahu homes uh, use yearly, um, and that kind of corresponds to about three percent of Oahu's total electric demand on an annual basis. Um, the project that uh, we're envisioning will have a 22-year project lifespan. That's the agreement that we've um, signed with Eco. Um, and we're very happy that the, the pricing that we've agreed to, which is at about uh, 11 cents per kilowatt hour, is about is, it's actually one of the lowest cost clean energy projects in the state. So we're happy to contribute towards HECO, HECO's renewable targets and um, do it at a very economical cost. Hmm. You're associated with Toyota. Can you tell us how? Sure. So um, Eurus is a, uh, a company that's actually been dedicated to renewable energy since the late 1980s. So some of our first projects globally were done in California uh, in like 1987. So kind of before um, renewable energy was, was really a big um, focus of a lot of other of the larger players, we were, we were really 100% dedicated to it. Um, we are a Japanese-owned company like you referenced. Um, our majority shareholder is a company called Toyota Susho, which is a publicly traded company. It's part of the Toyota Group, so not not like Toyota Motors, but part of the same kind of group of companies. And then um, our minority shareholder is Tokyo Electric Power, which is the um, you know the, the the major electric provider for the Tokyo metropolitan area. So we've got facilities all over the world. Um, again, all renewable, wind and PV solar. Um, and our operations out of the U.S., where we started doing our development globally, are, are based here in San Diego, where I'm, I'm sitting right now. Mm -hmm. And your first project, 1987, is still operating, the wind project, yeah? C correct. They are some of the earliest projects in the Mojave Desert, kind of right outside of Los Angeles. Um, yes, and they are still they are still up and running and generating power for, uh, for the people of the L.A. area. Very interesting. Okay, Peter, as far as Hawaiian Electric is concerned. Well, you see from what Nick has said, we've got a company with a long view of things, with an established track record. Uh, they come in, they build, they own, they operate, and uh, they, you know, we're very impressed with them. Uh, as, as Nick said, for our customers, 11 cents a kilowatt hour is one of the lowest rates. And for us, the main goal is to have a diversified portfolio, a renewable portfolio standard that includes 
all the solar we can get for sure, but all the wind that we can get reasonably, biofuels uh, on the other on islands where we have geothermal or hydro, we want that too. We can never get to 100% or close unless we take advantage of all these resources. And as I said, this is the last viable wind site on this island. Uh, and so, you know, this is a real step forward and 3% addition to our RPS um, is, is really dramatic in a single project uh, that has a, a very limited footprint, as Tony will tell you. And finally, as Tony will tell you, I'm sure, uh, you know, we're contributing to the re rejuvenation, the reforestation of the lands that have been uh, pretty sorely degraded in that area. Mm. So, uh, you know, we have a lot of infrastructure on the Leeward Coast, Kahi Power Plant, not perhaps the most beautiful site in the world, but very important to this island. We understand that, that we owe the people of that community a lot. And uh, reforesting, which will involve jobs and, and environmental growth and, and uh, opportunities, I believe, uh, is really a good thing all around. It's so a good partnership there. We believe it. Two things you said I want to uh, drill down on. One is uh, the notion that we need it for Oahu. Oahu has the greatest need, the greatest demand of all the islands no by question. far, by far. And um, so, and, and Oahu is the least amount of space. <laughs> True. So <laughs> you get a kind of intersection on that. Right. So that it becomes very important to have land dedicated to renewables so that we can provide renewables and, and build out. Yeah. Absolutely. When you think about it, it's not just the population. We have the, the main military establishment here, a huge consumer of, of energy. We have the University of Hawaii and a number of campuses, huge consumers. The banks, the hospitals are, you know, the headquarters of many, many companies, uh, and the biggest airport in the state and so on. You know, it, it's not just that we have 80% of the people, but we have probably 90% of the infrastructure of the state here. And that all requires electricity. And as you say, there aren't very many places uh, where you could put uh, these kinds of, this kind of infrastructure be, without um, being in somebody's backyard. And we understand perfectly that people are concerned what happens in their neighborhoods and their communities. And, and we, have, we all have to pitch in. I mean, there's just no room left for uh, nimbyism when we're facing uh, all this bad news about climate change, all this, you know, these, these very worrisome things happening to the to the climate and our, and we've experienced it directly. So it's not it's not theoretical. The other thing you talked about, I want to drill down on, is this uh, this notion of um, liability security, if you will, um, and diversification of the portfolio. Right. So if you had everything piled into one renewable methodology, um, that's not as secure, is it? Uh, as a portfolio of multiple uh, diversified technologies. Exactly. Be because if, if a, a, a catastrophe happens, if any event happens uh, that is likely to knock out one, it's less likely to knock out the other. Uh, tell me more. Well, exactly as you say. If we, we've spent almost 100 years depending on one fuel source, oil, imported uh, today mostly from Asia and, and the, the Middle East, and uh, that's expensive, it's, it's damaging to the environment, and it's very vulnerable to disruptions of any kind in the Middle East or Indonesia and Southeast Asia and so forth. To get off of that and to be on one uh, source, even if there were one source, which there is not, uh, would not be a good plan. The plan is to have as many different kinds as possible. As I said, biofuel, solar, wind are the main ones for this island, and uh, biofuel, biomass, so that we do have that kind of ability. Because each of these, uh, each of these technologies has different characteristics as well. Uh, you have to, you want as much firm power as possible, but you also need to accommodate variable power. You need to. Uh, you know, be able to balance a system that's getting increasingly technical and difficult to balance. So yeah. uh, that's why the, re the, the diversity is so important. On the firm question, I want, to, I want to talk to Tony about the firm question, and I'm relating back to a conversation we had before the show began. Uh, the remarkable thing about this wind project is that it's, it's firm, or almost firm, right? Well, Nick is better on this than I am, but one thing about solar is you know when it's going to happen which is noon, mm -hmm. and it tapers off on either side. So the difference between that, which produces an immense amount of power 
when you don't exactly need it and requires power shifting. The difference from that to wind is that wind will operate in other times. And so it provides a better input. Coal and ice. Not to use that parallel. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Nick, Nick can probably expand on this. But Nick, it, can it, you go further than it, that? It, it, it's doubly important because, as I understand, our project is currently structured. It doesn't require batteries. It's good enough to go as is. This is remarkable. This is important. That is, that's correct. So, sorry to, to interrupt. So and Tony Tony's absolutely right. You know, one of the, the unique features of of this wind wind project specifically, because there there are wind projects elsewhere that that um, the wind profile isn't as complementary with um, with PV solar generation, which of course happens during the daylight hours. Um, this project really does, in my mind, really facilitate additional solar generation because you're adding generation with this wind project when you really need it and can't get it with solar. It, we generate a, a substantial amount of our energy kind of on, a, on, an, annual, on, a, on an average day uh, at nighttime when there is no, there's no sun, obviously. So um, we don't really need the battery um, to, to store the power during the daylight hours when you don't need it because you've got a surplus of solar generation um, and release it at nighttime. So it, it really does um, complement uh, Hiko's success at deploying PV generation on their system and also further their um, their progress towards towards the, 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 the you know the, the higher mandates of renewable renewable energy so we look at it as kind of a win-win because it allows you to be balance the system more and also kind of continue that progress and a lot of this has to do with location and you are the location man in our conversation today you have a location that offers the possibility of continuing wind and that allows for relatively firm power from wind. No need for batteries. Save a fortune and all the complexities of battery technology. Well, it, it's, it's interesting because you've got maybe four sites on Oahu that could work for wind. Wind will blow nearly every place, but not at a commercial level. Now, Kaena Point blows wind, but it's certainly out. No one wants to touch Kaena Point, the lovely conservation area that needs to stay wild. You've got Kahuku, you've got the certain areas in the lee of the Ko'olau, and you've got the Palehua area. That's it. Mm -hmm. Now, what we have to offer from a technical point of view is that this happens to be adjacent to the Kaye power plant and adjacent to the trunk lines that feed central Oahu. So it's easy to connect. Well, if you were in Jamaica, you'd probably throw your bare wire over the, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, but <laughs> we're not. Uh, we'll have an adequate <laughs> clip, <don't> clip in, <laughs> you know, but yeah. it's not that hard to do. It, it doesn't require... <laughs> Don't talk about yeah. the duct tape. We're hoping for a technical replacement for duct tape. But the, the, the whole thing is that the, the proximity is there. And so you don't need to further pipe the power to some place it's needed. It goes right in where it is needed. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the land impact, though, uh, this is a very important point. Some people think that rooftop solar will solve it. No. Not even close. Not even close. Assuming as, oh, as, it's the technology, well, why do you there's say not enough space? Okay, it's not efficient enough, you right? Can't. Because if you have a, a given lot with a residence on it, the actual rooftop square footage is a really small percentage Look, of the lot. So, so, <laughs> solar is nice and clean, but it does not produce at a high rate for acreage use. Right. So, I'll give you an example. Um, assuming this project goes forward somewhat in its current form, and that's a four year permitting process during which things get switched around and altered and input is considered, we will probably end up with about three quarters of an acre actual footprint for the tower for, bases. For three quarters of turbine. an acre. Each. Now if we take Eurus's very exemplary YNI solar project and we scale that up to match the total annual power production, we would be talking an impact of somewhere between 530 and 550 acres. Way more acreage Look, this is for a given kilowatt. It would take more than the total inhabited area of Nanakuli Valley to equal what we can do on three quarters of an acre. This is acre. really an important point. Look, it's over 700 plus times more area efficient than solar. Yeah. People should want more wind. Yeah, they're big. The problem is big. Yeah. To address the problem is going to require a considerable bit of struggle. But from our point of view, we like the small footprint because it will enable us to reforest 
and maintain agricultural use in the area. This would be better land than it was, than it is now. No? Well, it bloody well better be. That's the purpose of our having got into this in the first, first place, <laughs> which is to reverse 300 yeah. years of environmental degradation by trying to restore something like the whole land forest. You're a conservationist, forest. aren't you, Tony? Initially, that's yeah. the starting point. Okay. But what do you do? Now, I, I am not against solar. We need everything that could possibly be done. But from a land use point of view, solar is like an artificial lava field. You can't graze it, you can't plant it, you can't preserve the archaeology under it, you, 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 you can't reforest it, you can't maintain recreational uses because it is a single purpose thing. But you can graze right up to the base of a wind turbine. You can plant flowers right up to the base of a wind turbine. And you can reforest in the gullies and not interrupt the wind flow. So what do you, what is, what does Gil Evelands bring to the table on this? You, you have some land. And uh, it would be helpful if the land were reforested and improved and all that. But w what are you bringing to the table of this deal? Ideas. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ideas. Peter's shaking his head yes. <laughs> yes, and, and, and I got to say, because Tony can't or won't, you know, the Gill family here, uh, you know, goes back a couple of generations. Tom Gill was lieutenant governor and member of Congress. Uh, the family has uh, Tom's brother, I guess. Lauren was the brother. Uh, it's probably the leading, you know, historically the one of the leading environmentalists in the state. Formed the Sierra Club, did a huge amount of, of uh, hands-on and, and teaching and, and guiding and, and inspiring people. The family has this intense environmental history, community service history. There aren't many families or companies who would be willing to commit to buying 1,600 acres of fairly, pretty substantially degraded land with the hope that in 20 or 30 years it can be reforested and reinvigorated. And we're very fortunate to have a family that's willing to commit. Put another zero on that timeline. Okay, I, you know, I won't be here in any case. But the, pro the point is you know, to, to have that kind of long-term look at uh, what's good for the community, what's good for the, the Aina. Um, we don't have many uh, institutions. I'd like to think Hawaiian Electric 126 years is, is you know, l like that. But, you know, in terms of putting their money where their mouth is, their hard work where their mouth is, uh, you know, the family is, in, is incredible to me. Well, we're, not, we're lucky. Thank you very much. We're let's, lucky. let's not leave out that there are a whole lot of people um, from UH folks, from Kapolei yeah. High School, from different community groups who have been up there to see what we're trying to do and are pitching in. Malama Learning Center is our partner. They do outdoor education and they are actually conducting. There's a certain amount of community, community support. That um, project. Yeah, and I think that you'll find the younger the person, the more they get it. Mm -hmm, uh, because when the sea level's coming over the highway and you can't get to town, right. It's going to be a this whole lot more. This project would vivid. not be affected by sea level rise at all. <laughs> no. It's up now. It's up over the lip on the top there. Well, can well, you describe the topography? Well, I, I can, but it's a whole lot easier to look at it on a map or to see it. But basically, if you're going by the Kahe Power Plant and you look up, there's kind of a bluff. It goes up about 400, 500 feet, and then it tips over and more gently wanders up the hill through gullies and pasture and such. That's where we're going to go. And we're going to locate the thing so that in Nanakuli Valley, you should not see anything. So it's, much it's not going to be in anybody's face. Well, everyone will feel duly offended, right? <laughs> okay. But what they have to understand. I will not feel you, duly you, offended. Maybe you will. Be sure of that. Okay. <laughs> but you, you understand the scale of the problem. People have not grasped the scale of the problem. And Hawaiian Electric, bless their heart, has studied this intensely, and if you bother to read the several thousand pages and go into the appendices, which, granted, only your viewership will do, you come to the end and you find a whole series of scenarios. And what we are able to do is say, look, by 2045, in the best case, we're going to need probably 5,000 acres of extra grid-scale solar production. In the worst case, which we hope never comes to pass, that if there were no further solar rooftop ad adoption, you'd be talking 20,000 acres. Wow. Okay, that's all the land between Village Park and the North Shore on the flat. That cannot be done. So we're going to face conflicts in land use. Now, we're trying to move 
play this chess game three, four movers ahead by sparing people 550 acres that would otherwise need that to go. It takes the pressure off the situation. Yeah. You know, how, how big is Ala Moana Park? Green area, about 90 acres. Yeah. How big is the stadium and all the parking? About 86 acres. 550 acres we don't need because we can put this stuff on three quarters of an acre. Yeah. And that, see, so Hawaiian Electric gets that part too because mm -hmm. they need to cover their future scenario. Well, I asked you before the, uh, the show, Peter, I mean, to me, this, this seems like a new chapter. It seems like, um, you know, can see the light at the end of the diversification tunnel. Um, you can see, um, see the possibility, the real possibility of getting to our goal with this kind of project. Getting a lot closer to our goal, that's for sure. Uh, you know, it, it's, as I said, it's not a one, not any one thing. We've got this lots project lots coming lots. along. Uh, we've got a number of solar farms, grid scale solar farms under construction. We're about to sign contracts with seven uh, more of them, four, three on Oahu, two on Maui, two on the Big Island. All of it, you know, every bit of it matters and every bit of it contributes to getting us closer to that goal. Uh, we've opened Schofield Power Plant in the last year, a fuel flexible uh, plant that can use biofuel and that uh, is located away from the ocean up on elevation and that is going to enhance our reliability and enhance our survivability in, in, in coming storms, our, mm -hmm. our resilience. Uh, you know, we don't have the luxury. Tony's a wind guy. He's got a wind farm and I love it. Uh, we don't have the luxury of saying, yeah, we just we just want to do wind. We want to do all the solar we Everybody's can. Everybody's got to throw everything they've got. We want got. to do all the wind we can. We want to get, to get geothermal. It. So uh, for us, I don't think it's so much of a turn as further progress on this road, okay, which we exactly. started on about 10 years ago. Glad to hear it described. It is a big step, but it is a step mm -hmm. among many steps that have to be taken. So Nick, um, you know, you mentioned it was 11 cents. Uh, it was pretty good. That's 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 really um, it's a very good number. Actually, it's ten point six nine. I remember that in the <laughs> press release. <laughs> it's not quite eleven. But how do you get there? How do you how are you able to um, you know provide wind to Hawaiian Electric at that price? That's not easy, and it's it's sort of um, it's remarkable. Yeah. So uh, a couple of things there. It's a good, it's a really good question. Um, you know, Tony had mentioned earlier that one aspect that was very that made the makes this specific site viable um, in a unique way is the loc the kind of the existing uh, location of the of the transmission infrastructure, the you know the power lines that come up from from the Kahe plant. So that is a very important aspect to the project because what that allows us to do is. Essentially, we don't have to build new infrastructure, and of course, new infrastructure, um, or extensive new infrastructure, rather, we can utilize what's already there. Because if we did have to, if we did have to build new infrastructure, you know, with that, those costs have to be reflected in ultimately the price. Because the price, essentially, in a very basic sense, is a is a function of the cost of the project to build, and you know, the wind resource. So. Right off the bat, you've got a site that has, um, from an infrastructure standpoint, is, is well situated because you're already using existing infrastructure. And then from a resource standpoint, like Tony said, there's, a very, there's very few locations remaining on Oahu that um, are viable from a, from a resource standpoint. Uh, and, you know, for example, he mentioned a kind of point that may be viable from a resource standpoint, from, but from a variety of other reasons, it's not viable. So the reason why, in a nutshell, we're able to get that pricing down such a such a low level is a combination of the resource being um, some of the best resource uh, on the island of Oahu and from a locational perspective, um, with regards to the infrastructure, it being really ideally located. So it's really kind of a... Um, uh, a win-win in terms of resource and, and infrastructure, and that's how we get to that price level. And okay, Nick, and you you, have... you've said, uh, you've mentioned in the past that although these turbines will look pretty much like other turbines we've all seen, that they're, they're becoming more efficient as well. Isn't that a factor in this That's price? right. That's right. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, Peter, thank you for reminding me. One of the other um, things that, have, that has happened in the industry over the last you know, decade is the turbines have gotten increasingly more efficient uh, at, at getting the resource, you know, frankly, out of the air. So as time has gone on, the manufacturers uh, have, been, have become a lot more sophisticated in 
all, all aspects of the turbine technology, whether it's the, the airfoils on the blades or more efficient, gener more efficient generators, and that's really unlocked areas that in the past may have not been viable from a resource standpoint um, until recently. So Peter's right that another really important factor has been the improvement in the technology of the turbines themselves that allow for um, the site to, to really offer uh, uh, a good price to, to HECO and, and HECO's customers. And, and these turbines and quieter. are... And quieter, I think Nick would... Mm, that's Nick important. Would uh, these turbines Correct. are 260 feet high. Well, what's the, uh, what's the diameter of the blade? How, is that, what, 90 feet, 100 feet? So the, 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 from the base of the, of the tower to the hub, which is kind of you know the middle of the of the rotor as we call it, uh, is 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 that is a 250 um, feet uh, figure. The rotor itself, kind of the the swept diameter, if you will, should be 116 meters. So I'm kind of trying to convert oh. meters into into feet. Okay, but thanks. It's a, we, we, but it'd be 116 meter rotor diameter machines. Wow. Okay, but because they're big, because they're high tech, they don't have to be as many of them as they used to have to be. Yeah. So you can, with Correct. Uh, 16, 16, only 16, really, of these turbines can cover uh, a lot of, uh, well, 26,000, did you say, homes and all that? It, it's a very large productivity, and I know that many people don't like to look at anything. What they're looking at currently is degraded biosphere. That's, it's not attractive to a biologist or anybody who enjoys the history of Hawaiian forest. But... You know, just like when clipper ships came in, clipper ships were immense. And these are kind of the clipper ships of <laughs> wind power. They're tall, they go fast, they make, but unlike the old pinwheel arrangement, you know, you can see some people setting up pinwheels for memorials and they're all a lot of little buzzy stuff. These are few and they have a more graceful pace. So mm -hmm. to me, they look like clipper ships. Are they strong, Nick? Are they strong enough to resist uh, extreme weather? Yeah, absolutely. So these are the turbines that we're anticipating for the site are, are going to be manufactured by a company called Vestas out of Denmark, and they have some of the longest history of, of manufacturing the, this type of technology in the industry. Um, they have turbines that are sited all around the world uh, in extremely um, you know, uh, difficult environments, whether it's the North Sea and offshore. So they have a lot of experience making sure that the type of design that you're utilizing for the project is suited to the site. And kind of as a specific reference to, to, to my company, Eurus, you know, we look at these projects um, in, a, in, a, in a way that an owner looks at them because we expect to be owning the projects for a long period of time. Uh, we have an uh, inherent interest in making sure the technology that we're purchasing and installing at a site will last for the life of the project. So we spend a lot of time, and there's a lot of a lot of engineers um, who understand the technical aspects far better than I do that that really agonize over these details to ensure that the the turbines are, are right for the site and won't have any issues during the operational period. On the purchase power uh, agreements, uh, these these agreements are 22 years long. Why 22? Um, uh, why not less? Why not more? What are the considerations that go into that? Well, I think 20 years is, is <laughs> sort of the, uh, you start from the 20-year point and then you, you look at what you can do. I don't think anybody envisions everything coming to an end in 22 years, but from a contracting legalistic basis, as I understand it, and I, I know less about both the legal and technical <laughs> things than Nick does, but, uh, you, Lots know, of you, you, involved. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you, you want to, in terms of, of, uh, of uh, you know, amortizing the costs and so forth, you look, you start by looking at a 20-year frame, uh, and then, then you move forward. But I, I don't. I don't think there's anything magical about the 22-year number. We have power plants, frankly, that are almost as old as I am, and that's fairly scary. That's saying something. Peter. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you know, th these are our long-term investments, and the contract is for 22 years. And I can't emphasize enough how attractive the price is. As you say, under 11 cents. I mean, the, the avoided cost of oil today is about 15 cents. Um, there is, uh, I don't think there's another renewable project, certainly not of this size, that is coming in under 11 cents. And it stays that. And it stays, it stays that, that for 22 stays years, so you have form. predictability. Right. And, and, you know, Hawaiian Electric doesn't take a markup or a profit on this. The, the cost is passed directly to the customers based on how much they use. 
So this is really a win for our customers, and we're very, uh, we're very gratified that we can bring it in, that Eurus can bring it in at this low price. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are too. Okay, last, uh, last words. Uh, Tony, what, what, what would you like to uh, leave the audience with? What, what message do you want to give them as a takeaway? And from our point of view as owners, this is not an energy project. It is an ecosystem restoration project in which Eurus and Hawaiian Electric are assuming a keystone position. They will enable us to do the fairly grand things we want to do. And we think that what, aside from the energy perspective, Hawaii needs to look at food sustainability, needs to look at putting water into the ground, it needs to manage fire and other hazards in the area. And on top of that, wouldn't it be nice to see something like uh, the ancient Hawaiian forest and all its wonderful hardwoods and species repopulating the area. That's where we're trying to get. And uh, we're grateful that Eurus has the muscle and the know-how and Hawaiian Electric has the foresight to see that this is a thing that can be done. We appreciate their collaboration. Mm. It's a wonderful use of the land, really, in our time. We think so. For our, for our state. We think so. Nick, what, what would you leave our audience with? So I would I would uh, try to follow up on on, on Tony's eloquent um, last words and say that we uh, at Eurus as a company are we're very happy to be working with what we view as two really unique and critical partners for this project. Um, you know Tony and his family and also Hiko. Um, it's a very unique project in that uh, unlike others, uh, it's not the same. This is a much 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 more deeper partnership between this, the three parties. So we're happy for this to be the second uh, large project that we're working on um, for the state of Hawaii, and we hope that this demonstrates our commitment to helping bring the state to its, uh, its renewable targets. So we're, we're excited about the, the possibilities going forward. And Peter, your, your uh, closing words, your takeaway, could you include your plan for other projects of this nature on Oahu or elsewhere? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've got uh, this wind farm. There's another wind farm that may be built on this island. Uh, we are uh, about to close on seven uh, new grid-scale solar uh, installations across, mostly across the central part of the island. Uh, the NR, what used to be called the NRG, or now called Cleanway uh, Solar Projects, 110 megawatts are uh, under construction. Westlock is under construction. Uh, You're going to be able to take all the fossil fuel plants offline here pretty soon. Pretty soon, I wouldn't want to say, <laughs> but sooner, you know, in a process, yes. you know, gradually over the next 27 years, we that's what we have to do. We have to uh, reduce our fossil fuel uh, footprint in, entirely to 100% is our goal. And the only way we do that is a step at a time, adding this project, adding the other projects. Um, we're going to see the biggest solar grid scale solar projects on the neighbor islands in this new uh, this seven uh, seven contract uh, movement that I mentioned. Um, so we're proceeding on a lot of fronts. And I would also say in a lot of other areas, we're working on the electrification of transportation to reduce oil use in that area. We're working on demand response programs, which will allow customers to reduce their bills by cooperating in our in our uh, maintenance of the grid. We're working on grid modernization because although this particular project can be hooked to the grid fairly simply and at relatively low cost, uh, we have to modernize our whole grid. Even if we got to 100, could get to 100% tomorrow, we don't have a grid that can accommodate it. We don't have a grid that can manage it so everybody's lights stay on. So we have, we're doing all these other things. We talk endlessly a lot about renewable energy and this project and that project. There is an underlying foundation that Hawaiian Electric is working on, grid modernization, customer programs uh, that are all part of getting to where it's we need to go. It's a great story. It's a great story, Peter. Thank you so much for coming down, Peter. It's a pleasure, and as Tony, always. thank you for coming down. Thanks, Jay. And Nick, uh, thank you for joining us today. Aloha. Thanks for having me, Jay. I appreciate it. Aloha. 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 This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Aloha, I want to invite all of you to